Hello, this is Mike, and welcome to another episode of Urban Legends and Mythology. So, I'm recording this on August 21st, and for those who don't know, the end of August is really a significant event for me, because my birthday is on August 29th. That being said, I really don't celebrate my birthday a whole lot. Hell, for several of them in my adult life, I actually worked right through them and didn't even realize they passed by. However, in recent years, as I get further on into my late 30s, I'll be 37 at the end of this month, I've really taken more time around that week of my birthday to really stop and kind of ponder my own life my own mortality, and what may lie beyond that. Now, I don't know if that's just something that naturally happens to all of us as we get older, but it seems as if my mortality is a subject that tends to come up a lot around the time of my birthday. Because, let's face it, with each passing birthday, that just marks another instance in which you realize you are getting older, and you will eventually have to face your own mortality someday. And it's in thinking about that subject which makes you wonder have we been through all this before do you really get just one go at it and it's just quits forever and then whatever comes afterwards is just your fate which is generally the dominant thinking in a lot of western cultures you get one go at it and then you go to either heaven or hell or to some kind of afterlife and that's just your fate forever or is it like a lot of eastern philosophies say is it cyclic are we just on a never-ending ride of birth life death birth life death vis-a-vis reincarnation which is essentially the subject of this episode we are discussing past lives past life regression reincarnation and whether or not our past lives can teach us anything or guide us in our current lives and the idea of what's so significant about our current lives how come we're experiencing this one right now and not a previous one or a future one but for the first time ever unlike always i don't really have a true logical beginning to start at so i'm gonna take a sip of this delicious new belgium voodoo ranger juice force ipa it is amazing it's nine and a half percent abv and it tastes like i'm biting into a hoppy orange and actually to be honest they're not a sponsor i just love the beers that they create so much that i am perfectly willing to give it free advertising for as long as possible And I just noticed that the skeleton dude on the can, he actually is wearing a flight suit and one of the patches actually says Ranger Zone and that is awesome. And see, it's little touches like that in your product, just in the product artwork, that takes it from being an awesome beer to being an extremely awesome beer. And I will continue to promote these guys forever because I love their product. But I got way off track. As I was saying, I don't really have a beginning to start at in this episode, so I'm just going to kind of riff on my idea of past lives and past life regression and reincarnation and all this stuff. And we're just going to drink some delicious Voodoo Ranger and we're just going to see where it goes. So this is going to be a really free form, barely edited episode, like old school season one style. Which means I'm just making this one up as I go along. There's no script, there's no notes. I'm just going to ramble, and I might Google some things and look at Wikipedia for some articles to give some context to some of the subjects I might touch on or deep dive into. So without further ado, while wow, four minute introduction and I didn't even promote myself, great. It's getting off to a great start. Without further ado, let's get into some past lives. So essentially the whole idea of past lives, it just follows the doctrine of reincarnation. And reincarnation pretty much is mostly associated with Eastern religions, particularly Hindu religions. However, the general idea seems to pop up across all humans from all backgrounds, despite what religion you ascribe to. Now for the most part, the Judeo-Christian mindset, it really only focuses on one life, one soul soul and that's all you get. However, there are even subsects amongst those cultures and people who are fully within those cultures who do believe in some kind of past life ideology. And it's something that actual scientists have been studying for at least the past half century. So maybe there is something to this idea. 
this concept that the soul or some aspect of the soul is simply reborn into a new life after it dies in the previous one and something from that carries on and sometimes early in life memories will still carry on and there are real accounts of people experiencing past life memories which are way too detailed and way too coincidental to just be written off as an overactive imagination and to be honest I kind of like to focus this on the stories of some of those accounts as opposed to just going into a whole philosophy Hinduism versus Jainism versus Buddhism versus whatever hell you can even throw the Rosicrucians in there so that whole deep dive into the philosophical side of things isn't going to happen here for two reasons one reason is I'm not an expert on those philosophies or those religions so I'm probably the last person that should be discussing them as if I'm an authority on them and two I just think it would make for a very boring discussion if I just regurgitated a Wikipedia article about reincarnation within those philosophies or religions. But I will regurgitate some interesting stories that I've heard over the years that gives weight to the idea that past lives happen and exist. So let's go ahead and get into some of those stories now. And I'm actually going to start with one from a UVA case study of an Oklahoma boy who was named Ryan. So one night at like 2 in the morning, Ryan, he's 4 years old, and he just wakes up from a nightmare, and he's bawling his eyes out, and he's screaming for his mom, so his mom comes to comfort him. And he's basically telling his mother, this isn't my home, I want to go home. I am so homesick, why am I here? And over the preceding months, he gives more details because he's begging his mom to take him to his home where he used to live. He describes the home as having a pool, several fast cars, and the fact that the home was much bigger than the one that they're currently living in. At one point, it's even noted that he said, I can't live in these conditions. My old home was so much better. And his mom recounts that he was like a little old man who couldn't remember all the details of his life, and he was so frustrated and sad. Well, then Eventually, they glean that the house that he's describing is in Hollywood. And at this time, Cindy's not really thinking that he's remembering something from a past life. She thinks that maybe he's describing this and she's going to do something to kind of soothe this kind of irritability. So one morning, in an effort to kind of calm him down, she goes to the library and she grabs everything she can find on Hollywood and old Hollywood. Books, pictures, archival documents whatever the library would let her bring home. So she brings him home and she has Ryan sitting there on her lap and they're just going through these old volumes of books and a lot of them have pictures of like old Hollywood and the mansions and the fast cars and all that stereotypical stuff you think of when you think of Hollywood. And at first he seems a little disinterested but then they reach a volume of Hollywood stuff from the 1930s and then this piques his interest. And as they're flipping through this book about Hollywood in the 30s kind of still in its golden era and then they get to this page and on this page there's a still of a scene from a movie a 1932 movie called night after night and he gets all excited and he stops or he tells her don't flip that page and he shouts mama that guy's me and he's pointing at that photo at one of the actors who wasn't identified he says that guy's me the old me. Now at this point Cindy, she's still a little bit shocked but she's also relieved because they have found the person that he claims that he was and with this knowledge they think that they have something they can go off of. However at the same time, neither her or her husband believed in reincarnation you know, they're living in Oklahoma so they're most likely just Christians. So the next day she goes back to the library and she checks out a book on child psychology, particularly a book on children who have past life memories and she actually gets a hold of the author who wrote that book who's a renowned child psychologist who deals in this kind of past life kind of memories and he gets in touch with the parents he interviews them he gets in touch with the child he interviews them he's debunking all this stuff to make sure he's not picking it up from his parents or friends or television or something like that 
He also gets in touch with an archivist who spends countless hours just poring over books and articles and whatever, just trying to find out who this guy was that this kid claimed to be and verifying all this stuff about this guy. And when the archivist gets back with him and they kind of cross-reference the research with what the boy had been telling him, they found that more than 50 details that Ryan had reported about matched details that pertain to this guy's life and they concluded that this four-year-old boy with no connection to Hollywood whatsoever couldn't have possibly learned this stuff from his parents or whatever because he was a rather obscure figure in early Hollywood. They find out that this guy was actually a Hollywood agent named Marty Martin who made one unbilled cameo in that movie night after night. And this seems to make sense that he wouldn't have had this from some third party source because think of it, how many Hollywood agents can you name? I can't name any except for this Marty Martin guy here that I actually had to look up because I couldn't remember his name. But then after this event was confirmed, they want to further confirm it. So they actually got a touch of Marty Martin's daughter who was still living in Hollywood and in that same house that he had lived in. And she was even to confirm a lot of stuff that this child had been saying not only about his life and his work history but he even knew the exact location and some of the exact contents that were in that home. And that's basically the story of Marty Martin and Ryan. Marty Martin was this obscure Hollywood talent agent who made this kind of cameo in this movie in the 30s. Eventually he lives out his life, he dies, and then he's reincarnated as some boy from Oklahoma. And I find in a lot of these stories that seem to be very verifiable that they're usually very mundane. The truly verifiable stories are ones that aren't these wild crazy things like you'll see like you'll go to a psychic and they'll do this like past life regression hypnosis type thing which I'll talk about later and they'll come out of that saying well I was Julius Caesar or I was Abraham Lincoln or I was some ancient Nubian princess or something like that. Generally when you hear those stories you know they're full of bunk and generally the people that tell you that are usually narcissistic or egotistical and they just want to show off that they have this great link to the past and you can pretty much debunk that stuff pretty quickly but generally when you look into this you find that the more verifiable stuff is usually the people who have these memories of where they were like a medieval peasant in France or they were somebody who died in war which is actually the next story I'll get into. Now this one's kind of a more famous story about past life regression and I'm just going to regurgitate it because it's one that I mostly know off the top of my head. So there's this kid named James and at about two years old he wakes up from a nightmare and he's screaming airplane crash plane on fire little man can't get out and this becomes kind of a recurring nightmare and it goes on and on for a while and the funny thing is even at this young age he knows stuff about World War II plane anatomy that no toddler would ever know, not without being extremely coached on it and mimic it, mimicking it like a parrot, but there's no evidence that his parents were doing that. So in one instance, his mother is playing with a toy plane, and she refers to something that's on the bottom of the plane as a bomb. However, James, he corrects her in that kind of way that toddlers do and he says no drop tank which is kind of curious because what two or three year old knows what a drop tank is on an airplane and in another instance his parents they're watching this documentary on world war ii and the narrator refers to a japanese plane as a zero and he actually yells out that's not a zero that's a tony and in both instances this kid was right without any prior knowledge of aircraft especially world war ii aircraft so as james gets older he keeps He's having these recurring nightmares about this plane crashing. He's having it like a couple times a week. And as he grows older, he starts having these memories and he says that his name was James in his previous life and he had flown off of a ship named the Natoma. Now the Natoma Bay was a World War II aircraft carrier that had served in the Pacific during the war and in its squadron was a pilot named James Houston who had been killed in action over the Pacific. Now 
to be honest, a lot of people did come out and attack James's parents as kind of implanting the ideas in his mind, and he's just parroting the stuff that his parents are implanting in his mind. However, even his father says that he was initially skeptical about a lot of this and thought that it was maybe just, you know, insane toddler talk. However, as James grew up and began talking about this stuff more and more and began acquiring this knowledge seemingly out of the ether, it seemed too coincidental to be true and when the family was researching this stuff the facts were just lining up and there was no one that could really debunk it. Now I am in no way saying that the inability to debunk something is evidence of the fact. However I am saying that it is very strange how these evidences line up in almost a perfect way and we see in many instances that even when things are too strange or too crazy to be true they somehow inevitably turn out to be true and our entire worldview gets changed challenged and has to change to adapt. And you know, people can argue all day, well, maybe it's just a hoax, maybe they're just making it up, whatever. We see it all the time on television, people make up these grandiose stories about past lives and it gives them their 15 minutes of fame and it's all just a big old lie and you know, that's that. And it is easy to say if you're just some kind of outsider looking in on this situation or these situations. However, when you get someone who's saying all this stuff and gathering all this information seemingly out of the ether, and then you have a child psychologist and archivists and other people who are backing up and verifying these details, these details that are very obscure sometimes, you have to question, are they really making it up? And even further, imagine if that was your child that was coming to you at the age of four or whatever and they're babbling about some crazy insane past life or some memory or something how quick would you be to just discount it as an overactive imagination especially if your child has never been exposed to any of this information you'd probably be wondering where it came from and once you start down that path of researching that you're probably going to realize that this person is having some kind of memories from a past life especially when the facts are just becoming too coincidental and lining up in these really strange ways. And another perfect example of that comes from another story. Now, I don't really remember which state this one takes place in. I just know it's America. So there's this nine-year-old girl, and her name was Anna. And she all of a sudden started having these dreams and these vivid memories of growing up in this ancient city. And by ancient, I mean like super ancient, like Bronze Age ancient. And what really makes this story stand out is just how mundane some of these memories were. They were just everyday boring memories. Memories of like preparing food and walking to the marketplace or even mundane memories about this almost like cave system that a lot of the families were housed in. Memories of the structure of the city they lived in, how the people dressed, etc, etc. You know, just those mundane, everyday things that you don't really think about. And it kind of goes on and on, and she even goes as far as to draw maps of, like, what her house looked like, and what her little city looked like, what the little square looked like, or the marketplace, and all this stuff. And at first, like all parents do with a nine-year-old, they're thinking, eh, she's probably just picking it up from television or the internet or whatever. You know, it's nothing to really think about. It's an overactive imagination of a child. But then they start paying closer attention because this isn't really the kind of normal overactive imagination that a child would have or would pick up from TV or something. It almost sounds like she's doing an anthropological report on this culture. And then one day she wakes up and she goes, Mom, I know the language. I can read the language. I need a pad and a piece of paper. So she's scribbling down all these symbols and what they mean and their sounds and etc. and translating it into English. And this really piques the parents' interest. So they go online and they see if these symbols match up to anything or these sounds or these words match up to anything. And what they find is actually kind of astonishing. It ends up matching up to an ancient city right on the Mediterranean Sea, an important port city called Heraklion. Now, Heraklion was on these kind of sandy islands in the Nile Delta, right on the Mediterranean Sea, and it was an important 
support for the Egyptians and later the Macedonian Greeks. And it was prone to earthquakes, which was funny because in her memory she said that a lot of people were leaving Heraklion because of earthquakes and the fact it was knocking down the buildings and it's very unsafe to live in. And it's said that she actually experienced the memory of her death coming from one of these earthquakes. And it makes sense because due to the geology around Heraklion, it was prone to earthquakes. And the geology of this area would eventually doom Heraklion because in the 3rd century BC, due to the geological phenomenon of liquefaction, the whole city and the surrounding area eventually sinks into the sea, and it essentially remains a lost city until World War II when it's rediscovered by pilots flying over the area, and it's not really into the early 2000s when archaeologists really went down underwater and started documenting this city, and the stuff was lining up. Her maps were lining up with maps that outlined the city, and the characters that she was drawing was matching the script on some of the tablets and stela and stuff that they were finding around this city. And again, at the end of the day, it was the very mundane nature and all the detail that seemed to match up that made it seem almost too good to be true. Now, the clever ones would notice so far that all of these cases are cases of children having these memories. And this kind of makes sense because a child's mind is more, let's just say, malleable than the minds of adults. And there's this general idea within reincarnation that the younger you are, the closer you are to that reincarnation, so the more likely you are to remember things from those past lives. And as you get older, it kind of disappears. And now, whether or not that's because we're growing into our current lives and those memories are taking over, or maybe it's the fact that our brains are developing more logical thinking patterns that we kind of push those into our subconscious, it's not really known. It's widely debated. But it's generally stated and believed that when you're a child, you're more likely to remember that stuff. And as you become an adult, you have to go through a process to tap back into those memories. And that process is called past life regression. And it's through that process of past life regression where you hear the stories of adults recalling stuff from their past lives. They have to go through this form of hypnosis, which is usually performed by either a psychic or a psychologist. A lot of times it's actually performed by a psychologist, which is kind of interesting. And it's essentially this guided form of hypnosis, which is really geared towards not only tapping into those subconscious memories that we may have forgotten, but tapping into those past lives that we may have forgotten and the memories from those. And it essentially happens in two ways. In the form of a psychic performing it, what they do is they take you to a room, they relax you, they recline you, they block out all the ambient noise and distractions, and then they hypnotize you. And then once you're under hypnosis, they start guiding your thoughts. They tell you to think about today and then think about the last few days. And then you're drifting back through the years, going all the way back to to your childhood and your birth and even before your birth and then all of a sudden you're walking down this hallway and at the end of this hallway there's this door and you're supposed to kind of focus on the door what the materials made of what the doorknob feels like whatever and then you're supposed to open that door and then when you step out that experience is you stepping into your previous life and then they'll start asking you questions the first thing they'll usually ask you is what do you see and if you don't see anything they might ask you well is it day or night and you might say day and then they might ask you to look down at your feet and are you barefoot are you wearing sandals you know what kind of footwear are you wearing and then maybe what's the ground look like around you is it sandy are you in a desert is it grassy are you inside or outside and you answer all these questions and go through and then eventually you're looking around and you're seeing what's going on in this memory almost as if you're in a dream and for some it may be a very mundane memory or it may may be the memory of their very death. It varies, and then the more you go through past life regression, the more memories you're able to tap into. Now, when psychiatrists do it, they do it in a very similar way. However, they start out by guiding you into that dream or that recurring memory or whatever you went to the psychiatrist for, and there are evidences and case studies of where this has been done countless times. So essentially what happens is the patient will come to the psychiatrist or psychiatrist 
psychologist or whatever it is. I don't really know the difference, to be honest, and I don't really care. But they'll go to that psychiatrist and they'll start discussing some memory they have or some dream that they're having, like a recurring dream, and they're trying to glean into like what it may mean. And generally during the session, they'll discuss it, they'll discuss the details of it, and the doctor will kind of glean whether or not it's some kind of childhood trauma, or some kind of repressed memory, or maybe if there's some kind of mental disorder involved, and he's eliminating all these factors. And at some point, after maybe several sessions, they'll discuss the possibility of past life regression and this hypnosis technique. However, sometimes the doctor will just put them under hypnosis just to see if it maybe is some kind of like past trauma or something that's dredging up this memory or if it's even just a false memory. You know, because these doctors, they're scientists and they want to eliminate all this stuff. Now, why a scientist is using hypnosis is here or there, it's kind of a gray area, but it is a tool that is in a psychologist's toolkit that they use. And there's a great story that illustrates this technique. It's another famous a story of past lives and past life regression. So this story comes from Georgia in the 80s and it involves a woman named Georgia Rudolph. Now she was a retired registered nurse. She had been adopted at the age of five and she lived a pretty normal life. However she always had these really strong and vivid memories of people and places and a time that she had never experienced or been to. One very vivid recurring memory is it's the wintry night and they're climbing into a carriage and she says that she can remember climbing into that carriage, how bracing cold it was, the smell of the horses, the sounds, the sights, it's as if she lived it. Other memories would involve stern wheelers, which are the old paddle boats that you would see on the rivers, you know, with the big red paddle mechanism in the back, a man in a brown suit and a derby hat, and rivers always played a big role in it. This river that they lived near or whatever, it always played a big role in these memories. And she says from her own account that when she was young, she would repeatedly draw this picture of this girl and she would repeatedly draw pictures of the house that this girl had lived in but she never really lets it interfere with her life you know she grows up she becomes a registered nurse she retires and so be it but she does always have this lingering curiosity about these memories so in 1984 she actually goes to a psychologist to discuss it because she's kind of wondering if these memories are just old repressed memories from the past when she was very young before she was adopted so she's trying to kind of figure that out and the psychologist is trying to figure this out too he's trying to figure out if these are repressed memories if it's some kind of childhood trauma or if it's maybe at one point he thought it could have been a multiple personality disorder now at the time the idea of reincarnation isn't on either one of their minds but after kind of debunking a whole lot of things and not really finding any logical conclusions he decides maybe i'll try hypnosis and i'll guide her into one of these memories and we'll see what we get so he's doing this hypnosis and when he says her name she doesn't recognize the name that he called her so he asks her what her name is and she says my name is Sarah Jean Jenkins I was born in 1895 and I live in Marietta Ohio she goes on to say that she's engaged to a man named Tommy Hicks who works on the river on one of the stern wheelers so they do further sessions of this regression and it dredges up more details details about her hometown some stuff about her day-to-day -day life and the tragic story that during their engagement Tommy actually had died in a riverboat accident and his body was lost in the Ohio River never to be recovered and then her fear that her family was going to ostracize her because she's carrying Tommy's baby and now there's no father to take care of this baby that she had out of wedlock and it seems that afterwards this would come true because in another memory she has shown her death and in this memory it's a cold winter's day and she's standing behind her house and the river was right behind her house so she's standing there on the riverbank and she 
she tears this locket off that she had been carrying, drops it on the ground, and then she walks into the river and drowns herself. So after several of these past life regression sessions over several years, they're kind of both convinced that she's having memories from this past life. But being naturally skeptical, they decide that they want to kind of put it to the test. So she actually reaches out to this like newspaper reporter like historian type dude who lives in Marietta which is a city that she had never been to in her life however she has all these memories of walking around it so she goes to Marietta and meets this guy and he's like I'm gonna take you to a few places and she's like no I'm actually gonna take you to a few places and tell you what I remember and Marietta is not a really big city here in Ohio it's actually a very small city and you could pretty much walk around it in maybe a half hour an hour tops however it's still a city because in Ohio anything over 5,000 people is considered a city according to our state constitution but I digress but anyway Georgia and this reporter guy they're walking around Marietta and she's taking them around to all these places and it's as though that she knows this downtown area like the back of her hand they actually stop in front of a building that was an insurance building she tells them this used to be like an ice cream parlor and she goes on to describe what it looked like and who owned it and this historian he goes on to say that she was telling him stuff that even the old timers that he would talk to in the town didn't even know however remember this is kind of a test she wants to see if she's actually correct about this stuff or if she's actually crazy and this being the 80s you know the internet didn't exist this reporter's got to do all this fact checking you know it's not like today where you can just type a city name into google and you can get the entire history of that city right then and there this guy he had to go to the library and research through the archives and all the old newspapers and land deeds and all that stuff to try to verify what she was telling them. And this local historian, he can't find where she's wrong. Everything she said lines up with what he's finding in his research. And he knows damn well that she didn't come to Marietta and pour through these archives for weeks looking up this information. And that historian, he went on in an interview and and said that he doesn't really believe in the whole reincarnation thing, but it's almost supernatural how she's able to tap into the history of this area so vividly. However, for a little while, they would reach kind of a dead end because nowhere could they find the name Sandra Jean Jenkins or Tommy Hicks in any records, nor any documentation of a man being lost in the Ohio River in 1914 after a sternwheeler accident. However, they are able to find a deed to a nearby farm, which was owned by the Hicks family, and it's believed to have been his parents. But despite the lack of documentation, here's the thing, she actually didn't live in Marietta. She actually lived a few miles outside of Marietta in a town called Newport. And she finds out where this house is in a couple of different ways. One is through this recurring dream that she always has, and another was she was able to actually just go there and recognize it as soon as she saw it. So in this recurring dream that she's always had, she's walking through this cemetery and she goes down this straight path and then this windy path, and then she ends up at her grandmother's grave. And it's once she gets to that grave and looks down, she always wakes up at that exact same point. She never sees the name of her grandmother. However, in 1985, Georgia makes her way to the cemetery and she knows exactly where to go. She goes exactly to that grave and for the first time in her life, she's completed that dream. She sees the name of her grandmother and she finally looks down and she sees the name and she sees the name Mary Bevan Jean. So with this name in hand, she's able to track where the Jean's house was and when she's driving up towards it, as soon as she sees the house, she stops and just freezes because she knows that's her house. And furthermore, she knows exactly where her bedroom is. She knows that that's her house. So she goes on to get a hold of the family and the family, they're telling her all the stories about their family history and blah, blah, blah but then none of them know who Sandra Jean Jenkins is. But it's when one of the family members presents her with a photo 
of a family reunion when she spots Sandra. She's standing there in front of the house with the whole family. However, while everybody else is kind of huddled together, she's kind of by herself as if she's being isolated or ostracized. And the thing is, everybody in that photo had their names like scrolled on the back except for this one girl. And all the family could tell her was, we don't know who this is, but the family legend says that she drowned out back in the river. But she knew without a doubt it was her because that had been the same face that she had drawn over and over again since childhood. Now, unfortunately, she's unable to find the exact location of her grave because she was a suicide. All they could tell her was they think she's buried somewhere near the family plot in an unmarked grave. And this makes sense because in that era, if you were a suicide, in a lot of Christian mentality, you could not be buried in hallowed ground. You were doomed to go to hell, basically. And another reason the grave probably wasn't marked was because by this time the evidence shows that she was probably on the outs with her family. And I've seen that photograph, and what I said is true. She does look like she's kind of there alone while the rest of the family is together. And let's not forget the scandal with this unborn child out of wedlock. Now, whether or not she was pregnant with that child when she committed suicide or if maybe she had aborted that child, we don't know. But that would cause a stigma and might be why her name is erased from the family history. However, Georgia does have an idea of where she thinks that Sandra might be buried because in her dream, not too far from her grandmother's grave marker, is a statue of an angel with its hand up, and she believes that she may be buried under that statue. And this story of reincarnation is just one of those stories that is extremely hard to debunk because both entities, the psychiatrist and Georgia, they both went into this with the thought that maybe it's some kind of mental illness. They didn't think that it was reincarnation. Remember, she's from Georgia. She's a Christian. And, you know, that wasn't in the realm of possibility. So they both went into this as skeptics. And they both come out of it as kind of believers. And we have to remember that in her case, these memories are real. These feelings are real. She really experienced them. And for all the outsiders, who were kind of just looking in on this, they couldn't find any alternatives to why these facts were lining up so well. They couldn't find any alternative to why somebody who had never been to a city in their life knew literally everything about that city from the era in which the person in her previous life lived. And to be honest, everything was done in a very scientific and methodical way. These people were not charlatans. They were genuine in everything. They actually set out to kind of debunk that idea because they thought maybe it had been some repressed memory or some kind of mental illness. But sometimes in the scientific method, when you go to kind of debunk something and the evidence shows the opposite, you kind of have to roll with the evidence you're presented. And in this case, the evidence presented was kind of too crazy and fantastical to ignore. Now, some of the extremely skeptical might state that maybe this psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever, was implanting false memories. Under hypnosis, it is possible to implant false memories into people. It's been scientifically studied. It can happen. And in this argument, they use the famous case of the mass reincarnation of the Cathars because this is a case and a story where that might have happened. Now, it has never been proven that this doctor did implant false memories into to at least one patient who was a long-time patient who was undergoing these past life regression sessions. But there are some things where some people who have researched this story had seen some red flags and wondered, hey, maybe were they playing off of each other? Because this psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever, he actually went on to cash in and publish a book about this. Now, in this particular story, I'm not going to deep dive too much into it. I'm just going to hit some of the bullet points because it is very in-depth and it could probably deserve its own episode. So, it's the 1960s and there's this doctor and his name is Arthur Gurdum in England, particularly in Bath where this mass reincarnation takes place. It's amongst these group of people in Bath. So Dr. Gurdum, he has this patient, and he never gives her name because, you know, patient, doctor, confidentiality. Let's call her Mary. I don't remember the pseudonym he used in the book, but I'm going to call her Mary. So Mary essentially just has these recurring dreams of being this, like, peasant girl in 
southern France in like the 11 or 1200s. Now, she had been having this one recurring nightmare of she's asleep and this man slips into her room and this man fills her with terror and fear. And then that's when she wakes up and she's trying to make sense of this recurring nightmare. Now, for context, even though Gertham was a well-respected psychiatrist, he had long been fascinated with this area in France known as the Pyrenees, where at one time in 1244, this wholesale massacre of this group called the Cathars took place. Now, the Cathars, they were this religious sect, a very popular religious sect in southern France and northern Italy at the time, who had broken away from the Catholic Church. And they had this belief that earth was hell and all the earthly pleasures were the temptations of hell. So they abstained from sets. They believed that reproduction was dooming another spirit to hell. You know, they wouldn't eat certain foods. They didn't really believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And what really pissed the Catholic Church off was they believed that women were equal to men and could be like priests in their little religion. So the Catholics, in true Catholic fashion, launched a crusade against them and committed genocide against them, and the holdouts were actually in this little fortress, and they knew they were gonna die, and they surrendered, and they were all burned at the stake as heretics, because nothing says Catholic love like burning people at the stake as heretics and committing genocide against people who don't agree with what you believe. Those crazy Catholics, I could rant about them for ages. But that's kind of the gist of the Cathars. So Dr. Gurdum, he had this like obsession with this event in history. And at one point in 1963, Mary is in a session with him, and since her memories seem to fall in the same region with the same era, he casually mentions the Cathars, to which Mary, coincidentally, had been reading a book about that very day and become very fascinated with. You see where we're going with this. So they start playing off of each other. After this, Mary tells Dr. Goodham that she had been having dreams about him, that in a past life in the 13th century in Toulouse, she saw herself as a Catholic pleasant girl named Perilla, and Gurdum was Roger Isarn de Aberens. I don't speak French. Well, I read French, but I can't speak it. Who was a traveling Cathar preacher? And the story kind of goes that he's involved with this other guy, a cousin, who are involved with the murder of some inquisitors because the Inquisition was like torturing Cathars to get names or whatever. And and he's eventually arrested and dies of disease in his dungeon, and she's captured by the Inquisition and burned at the stake as a heretic. And then they meet again in Bath, England, and they have this shared experience and blah, blah, blah. And there are other people who have similar stories around the time in the area who believe they were mass resurrected. And they talk about the Inquisition and that final stand in the Pyrenees and then marching to their death and being burned at the stake. And some of them couldn't face that fate, so they threw themselves off the cliff and committed suicide. And they kind of accept the resurrection story because in Cathar beliefs, you have to like resurrect sometimes in order to, I guess, gain enough whatever to ascend into heaven. And then he goes on to write a famous book about it and becomes this big best-selling book. And it allows him to indulge in his Cathar obsession. So a lot of skeptics will use it as proof that, hey, this is all bunk, it's false memories, it's the patient and the psychiatrist or the person and the psychic just playing off of each other. And while it's true, there are charlatans out there in the world that will take something like this and take advantage of it. But however, just because there are charlatans out there that take advantage of the phenomenon doesn't actually debunk the phenomenon. In a lot of the ways, it actually strengthens it because it gives you a clear guide of the red flags to look out for when encountering one of these stories. And to be honest, it's not really known whether or not they were charlatans. They might have believed 
what they were discussing and talking about. I mean, Mary, she claims that these experiences and these dreams were real. However, they may have been misinterpreting some things due to their shared interest in that history. But we can't really ask them because Gertam is dead and Mary, as far as we know, is deceased. Because this took place in the 60s and it's just kind of hard to believe that she's still alive to this day. But is it possible for somebody like me, who's a natural skeptic, to believe in this phenomenon? On. And I say that when I usually look at this stuff and I weigh the evidence against the BS, the evidence usually wins out. And it's not because I don't have a way to debunk it, it's just sometimes things make too much sense. However, I don't know. I've never had one of these past life regression therapy sessions, nor have I ever had any memories or like deja vu events that make me think, hey, maybe I experienced that in a past life. And if I have one of those sessions, who knows, I might end up believing it. Just like in Arnett's case with Robert Snow, who actually did one of these sessions on a dare. So, Robert Snow, he was a captain in the Indianapolis Metro Police Department, and he was kind of over that, like, robbery homicide division. Which, to be honest, I didn't actually know that was a real division. I always thought that was just some kind of Hollywood thing, but yeah, it's a real division in a police department. And he's a great police officer, you know. He writes books on police procedure and how to interpret things in a crime scene. And, you know, he's really made a name for himself as this great police officer, this great level-headed guy. So I think it was in, like, 1993. He's at this dinner party, and he's got a bunch of people from work there. And one of the people from work there is, like, the police psychologist. And they're talking like you do at a dinner party. They're going off from subject to subject, and then they get onto the subject that, in her spare time, she does past life regression sessions. And Snow, being this very logical, skeptical guy, he's like, yeah, sure, that's all BS, blah, 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 it's probably false memories, whatever, I've heard about that on, like, Unsolved Mysteries or whatever, it's all bunk, I can't believe you do that in your free time, you know? And she kind of comes back with, well, have you ever participated in one of those sessions, you know, if you're gonna talk about it, you should know what you're talking about, and he's like, well, no, I've never been to one of those sessions, I'm not a sucker, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, well, you know what, I dare you to go to one of those sessions, and after that, come back to me and tell me what you experienced. So he's like, okay, I'll take your dare, but I'm not going to you, I'm going to go to somebody else, like an independent psychologist, who's going to do this, and we're going to prove to you that it's a bunch of BS. And she's like, okay, on. So they book this therapy session, and he's like, what am I doing here? This is stupid. Stupid. But, you know, for the sake of the bet, I'm going to play along. So the therapist relaxes him, gets him under like this light form of hypnosis, as you do. And a lot of psychologists or psychics who do this will ask you to look around and see if you see a guide. So she says, do you see anybody around you? And he says, I see a woman in a white dress, but don't all ghosts wear white dresses? And he kind of scoffs. And the psychologist says, okay, that's going to be your guide. That's going to be the person who's going to escort you into this previous life and then escort you back here. And the session goes on, and the next thing he knows, he's in this artist studio with a skylight in the late 90s. 19th or early 20th century and it was a very vivid experience he said he could feel the sun coming in on his face he could smell the paints he could feel the canvas he could feel the brush in his hand and he's painting this portrait of this hunchback lady and he said that he actually really hated painting portraits but he was this poor kind of unknown artist and painting portraits was really the only way he could make money off of this particular skill he goes on to recount that he goes by the name of Jack and that him and his wife had spent some time in France. Probably because in the late 19th century that's where all the artists flocked to. It was kind of considered the art capital of the world at the time. He goes on to state that him and his wife were very poor and she was barren, which means she was unable to have children, and they would frequently argue over money, but they generally had a happy marriage. And further, he goes on to say that his wife eventually died of a blood clot and that he had died in autumn in 1917 in a large city surrounded by tall buildings. So he comes out of this regression session and he's still kind of skeptical. He thinks, well, maybe I just tapped into an old memory of a story 
story that I read in a book or an old painting I saw and the story associated with that. So like the good police officer he was, he goes on this like major research mission to try to find this story, this artist, this portrait. So he's pouring through books on art and he's going to art dealers and museums and I guess college universities, talking with the art history professors I guess, and he keeps hitting these dead ends. He cannot find this portrait or the name of this painter anywhere. So after about a year of searching, he kind of just throws in the towel and gives up. And it's a little bit later while he's on a vacation with his wife, they're actually going to New Orleans, and on the last day of his vacation, he kind of just wanders into an art gallery, and they're just kind of admiring the art. And then all of a sudden, he just stands in front of this portrait, and he freezes. He said it was like a bolt of lightning or an electrical surge went through him because out of pure random chance, he's in front of that painting from his vision, from his memory, and he's just in this state of shock. He knows that painting. He knows every brushstroke of that painting, and he just can't believe it. He describes it as being surreal, like in a dream. How can I randomly just walk into this place and find the painting that I've been searching for for a year, that I've given up on searching for? So while he's there, he gets in touch with like the docent or the art dealer or whoever's there at the time who can give him some information on this painting and the docent or the dealer or whatever tells him that this painting was painted by a character called J. Carol Bickwick and after that he thinks okay well maybe I saw this at an exhibition or in a museum or something and I'm just remembering it now so he goes on to ask the docent or the dealer or whatever where else has this painting been displayed like recently? And he says, well, this is the first time it's been displayed in over 75 years. It's been in a private collection. So no, you would have never seen this in an exhibition until it came up for sale just a little while ago. And furthermore, the artist, he wasn't really famous or well known. So there wouldn't be any real articles or anything written on him. And in fact, the last time any of his art was really exhibited was in 1911. And this was the first time in Snow's life where he really didn't have an explanation for this. He couldn't debunk it scientifically, and since then his perception on this idea had changed. And he actually went on to write a book about this experience, and I guess to this day, if he's still alive, I don't know, this was in 93, that he's still a believer of this phenomenon. And that's just one of, I'm sure, several stories that are similar. And for myself, personally, I don't see why it couldn't be true. I mean, a lot of people that undergo these sessions tell them that the memories are real, the feelings are real, the experiences are real. So for them, it is real. So who am I to say that it's fraudulent or implanted false memories or something like that? And this is an experience that permeates across all of mankind, despite your religious views. And you can believe in it or not, but I would say that if you ever did have one of those experiences, you might not want to discount it because it might be relevant to something in your current life. And at the end of the day, to be honest, I think it would be fascinating to see if I had lived past lives, and especially if it had been in some awesome historical time that I'm interested in. But unfortunately for me, at this particular time, it seems like it's the time to wrap up this episode. So, as always, this is Mike. I thank you for listening. And if you did enjoy this or any of the other episodes, just do me a solid and tell a friend. That is the fastest and best way to grow the this show. And if you are a listener, but you're not a subscriber or supporter or follower or whatever, go ahead and click those buttons and click those links because that does really help the show out. With a niche kind of topic like urban legends and mythology, folklore, whatever, it doesn't really show up in a lot of algorithms. It's not really popular. You know, I'm not trending number one on Spotify or whatever. In fact, a small show like this, I'm pretty far from it. But I do love creating this show, and I would love to grow it and grow kind of the listener base and create some kind of community around it, and that doesn't happen without you guys' support. So for those who are already listening and supporting me, I do thank you. I appreciate it. And for you new guys who this may be your first episode, join the Death Bunny Squad. Become part of the community. Support it. Whatever. 
We'd love to have you. We find new, crazy, macabre, weird rabbit holes to dive down every week. So why not become a part of that? It's fun. It's awesome. And we're usually drunk when we do it. Shameless self-promoting aside, I do appreciate you all. And I will see you in the next one.